Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton. Chapter 2. Introductory Quote. The clash of cultures in the classroom is essentially a class war, a socioeconomic and racial war, fair, being waged on the battleground of our schools with middle class aspiring teachers provided with a powerful arsenal of half truths, prejudices, and rationalizations arrayed against hopelessly outclassed working class youngsters. This is an uneven balance, particularly since, like most battles, it comes under the guise of righteousness. Kenneth Clark, Dark Ghetto Losing <clears throat> Because we moved around a lot when I was growing up, I attended almost every grammar and junior high school in the city of Oakland and had wide experience with the kind of education Oakland offered its poor people. At the time, I did not understand the size or seriousness of the school system's assault on black people. I knew only that I felt constantly felt uncomfortable and ashamed of being black. This feeling followed me everywhere without let up. It was a result of the implicit understanding in the system that whites were smart and blacks were stupid. Anything presented as good was always white. Even the stories teachers gave us to read in the early grades, Little Black Sambo, Little Red Riding Hood, and Snow White and the Seven Dwarves told us what we were. I remember my reaction to Little Black Sambo. Sambo was, first of all, a coward. When confronted by the tigers, he gave up the presents from his father without a struggle. First the umbrella, then the beautiful crimson, felt-lined shoes, everything, until he had nothing left. And afterward, Sambo wanted only to eat pancakes. He was totally unlike the courageous white knight who rescued Sleeping Beauty. The knight was our symbol of purity, while Sambo stood for humiliation and gluttony. Time after time, we heard the story of Little Black Sambo. We did not want to laugh, but finally we did, to hide our shame, accepting Sambo as a symbol of what blackness was all about. As I suffered through Sambo and the Black Tar Baby story in Br'er Rabbit in the early grades, a great weight began to settle on me. It was the weight of ignorance and inferiority imposed by the system. I found myself wanting to identify with the white heroes in the, pr in the primers and in the movies I saw, and in time I cringed at the mention of black. This created a gulf of hostility between the teachers and me, a lot of it repressed, but still there, like the strange mixture of hate and admiration we blacks felt towards whites generally. We simply did not feel capable of learning what the white kids could learn. From the beginning, everyone, including us, judged smart blacks in terms of how they compared with whites, whether they could read or do arithmetic as well as the white kids. Whites were the standard of comparison in all things, even personal attractiveness. Bushy African hair was bad, straight hair was good, light was better than dark. Our image of ourselves was defined for us by textbooks and teachers. We not only accepted ourselves as inferior, we accepted the inferiority as inevitable and inescapable. By the third or fourth grade, when we had began to do simple mathematics, I had learned to maneuver my way around the teachers. It was a simple matter to put pressure on the white kids to do my arithmetic and spelling assignments. The feeling that we could not learn this material was a general attitude among black children in every public school I ever attended. Predictably, this sense of despair and futility led us into rebellious attitudes. Rebellion was the only way we knew to cope with the suffocating, 
repressive atmosphere that undermined our confidence. Of all the unpleasant things that happened to me in elementary school, I remember two in particular. I had disciplinary problems from the beginning, plenty of them, but often they were not my fault. For instance, in the fifth grade at Lafayette Elementary School, I was 11. I had an old white lady for a teacher. I have forgotten her name, but not her stern, disapproving face. Thinking once that I was not paying attention, she called me to the front of the room and pointedly told the class that I was misbehaving because I was stupid. She would show them just how stupid I was. Handing me a piece of chalk, she told me to write the word business on the blackboard. Now, I knew how to spell the word. I had written it many times before, and I knew I was not stupid. However, when I walked to the board and tried to write, I froze, unable to form even the first letter. Inside, I knew she was wrong, but how could I prove it to her? I resolved the situation by walking out of the room without a word. This happened to me time and again, growing worse with repetition. When I was asked to read aloud in class or spell a word, my mind went black and cold. Everybody thought I was dumb, I suppose, but I knew it was the lock inside my head. I had lost the key. Even now, when I read to a group of people, I am likely to stumble. The other incident also happened at Lafayette. The school had a rule that you could dump the sand out of your shoes after recess, just before you sat down. One day I was sitting on the floor, dumping the sand from each shoe. I had quite a bit of sand, and dumping it took time. Too much for the teacher, who came up behind me and slapped me across the ear with a book, accusing me of deliberately delaying the class. Without thinking, I threw the shoe at her. She headed for the door at a good clip and made it through just in front of my other one. Of course, I was sent to the principal, but I received a great deal of respect from the other children for that act. They backed me for resisting unjust authority. In our working and lower class community, we valued the person who successfully bucked authority. Group prestige and acceptance were won through defiance and physical strength, and both of them led to racial and class conflict between the authorities and the students. The only teacher with whom I never had trouble was Mrs. McLaren, who taught me sixth grade at Santa Fe Elementary School. She had taught my brother Melvin several years earlier, and since he was a model student, Mrs. McLaren's expected a lot of me. I felt, in turn, a responsibility to live up to Melvin's reputation. Mrs. McLaren never raised her voice. She was a tranquil person, at ease and peaceful, no matter what was happening. Nobody wanted to start a fight with her. She was the exception to the rule. By then, however, even in the sixth grade, I had such a tough reputation in school, there was no need to start fights with the instructors. They were waiting for me and often provoked trouble, thinking I would pull something anyway, even when I was going along with the program. I went through a series of conversions and lapses. Each suspension brought a strong lecture from my parents, followed by a week or so of heavy soul-searching and a decision to cooperate with the teachers and give my best effort. Mother and father argued that the instructors had something I needed and that I could not expect to go into the class as an equal. I would return to the school full of firm and good intentions. 
Then, invariably, the instructors would provoke me, thinking I was there to continue the struggle. Sharp words, a fight, expulsion, and another semester down the drain. It often seemed that they simply wanted me out of the classroom. During those long years in the Oakland public schools, I did not have one teacher who taught me anything relevant to my own life or experience. Not one instructor even awoke in me a desire to learn more or question or explore the worlds of literature, science, and history. All they did was to try to rob me of the sense of my own uniqueness and worth, and in the process, they nearly killed my urge to inquire. End of chapter 2